And, and when you talk about doing that much, you know, selling that much marijuana, uh, how are you sourcing all this stuff? You know, because obviously you weren't growing it all yourself. Well, back then, man, you know, the Jamaicans was running things, man. The Jamaicans had that good tie stick and that good endo back then, man. It wasn't all these exotic um, strands that they got now. You know, back then it was kind of simple, you know. It was like, give me some of that good tie stick or give me some of that sticky endo, you know. And so back then the Jamaicans kind of was the ones who really had the good weed back then, you know. And I and I was a slick talker, man. So I knew how to I knew how to negotiate at a young age. Okay, and you yourself were not smoking weed at all. A couple of times it gave me a headache, and um, one of my aunties told my mama she seen me smoking weed, and my mama confronted me, and I never forget this. My mama confronted me, and she like, yeah, um, I heard you um, was smoking some weed, you know, and I tried not to lie to my mama as much as, as I could back then. And so I said, I said yeah, I, I smoked a little weed. And she asked me, how did it make you feel? I said, gave me like a headache after the fact. She said, well, you know, smoking weed, you smoking weed today, tomorrow you might want to try some cocaine. I said, no, nah, I ain't gonna try no cocaine. Make a long story short. From that day she confronted me about that weed, I never picked up no weed from that day once. She asked me why I was doing it. I said, I was just doing it because the fellas was doing it. And I, at, at that point, I never picked up, I've never smoked no weed from that point when my mama confronted me. Smart. Very smart. Not getting high from your own supply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then it switches over to cocaine. And what year was this? Was it like 1979, no, 1980? No, 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 86. Like 86, 80, 86. 80, yeah, 86, 86 is when I started dabbing into the, to the cocaine. See, because remember, a lot of people thought I was older than what I was because I had all these guys that was older than me and bigger than me following behind me. So they always thought I was the older guy, but I was the younger one. Were you considering yourself, were you, were you 69 mob yourself or did you have your own thing going? I had my own thing going because I, I wanted my own identity. Now, of course, I was associated with a 69 Mob because that's who I grew up up under. But I always wanted to make my own identity and I, and I wanted to operate differently from my older partners, though, because I watched some of the mistakes they made, you know? A lot of them used the drugs, but back then it was a cool thing to do, you know? Them and their girlfriends, they snorted powder. They snorted powder back then, or they put cocaine in cigarettes and weed. They called them blasters or cavies back then, and to them that was just a part of the life. You know, you hustling in the streets. They going to the clubs. They getting money. You know, we having a good time. So I watched that at a young age, and I used to listen to their conversations, and I used to say, "Man, these dudes messing off all their money, though." You know. So I said, I'm going to stay away from them things so I can have a clear mind and I know what's going on around me, you know. And I was observing these dudes at a very young age, paying attention to the conversations and how they carry themselves. So I always said that for those reasons, I wasn't, I didn't want to use drugs or I didn't want to drink, you know. So, so before, before you switched over into, into crack, in 1980, uh, the 69 Mob went to war with uh, another crew called The Family. Mickey Moore. Mickey Moore, exactly. So you you actually saw this and, and saw the, you know, the effect of all this. Yeah, well, well, remember, back then we were so young, so we had, at nighttime, we couldn't be outside in the projects. We couldn't go to certain areas because it was a drug war going on. So as kids, they tried to protect us by making sure we wasn't out at night, that we wasn't in certain areas because they didn't want no harm to come to us at such a young age. Okay, and, and Felix Mitchell, he actually aligned himself uh, with the Black Panthers. No, that, he, he didn't align himself with no. the Black Panthers. That, that story right there is not true. Really, the Black Panthers, they really, they didn't want them Felix and them doing the harm to the community that they was doing, which was selling heroin. So the Black Panthers, back then at the time, they really tried to approach Felix and them and extort them. 
But Felix and my older partners that grew up in the 69 village is not nobody you want to try to extort. You know, right. you, you do your history with them. You know, them guys are some of the most ruthless guys that that you want to know coming from the streets. So when when I when I came became who I was, I didn't have to use no violence or nothing like that anyway because they already respected me from what my older homeboys had already done laid down. You know? Got it. Got it. Okay, so then 1985, Felix Mitchell goes to prison. Yeah, he goes, he gets convicted. They give him life without. He the first one they get a life, life without for the CCE2. And he know he gonna, he, he gonna die in jail. You know? Right. So, so he goes to prison, and what, what was the effect in Oakland when suddenly you have the head of this huge drug empire get, gets you know, taken off the streets? Um, sort of um, people fighting for territory, you know, fighting for that territory, man, because back then, Heron was a lucrative, was a lucrative business, you know? It was a lucrative business, you know? 